Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second talk in our summer research seminar series, Out to Sea. My name is Rebecca Tropp, and I am the research and events convener here at the Paul Mellon Center. And I'm, I'm very happy to introduce this evening's speaker, Faye Hamill, who will be giving an approximately 30-minute talk, followed by a response from Bruce Peter. After a conversation between Faye and Bruce, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Those of you in the room will be able to ask your question directly to Faye and Bruce. We'll have you speak into microphones. And for those joining us online, please type your questions in the Q&A box, and then I will read them out. As a brief introduction to today's speakers, Faye Hamill is professor of English literature at the University of Glasgow. Her research focuses on transatlantic literature and culture in the early 20th century, with a particular interest in themes of social and geographical mobility. And I became aware of her work through discovering her current AHRC-funded project, Ocean Modern, which explores the meanings of the ocean in the literary imagination. Faye is the author or co-author of six books, board member of several maritime heritage organizations, and fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Bruce Peter is professor of design history in the Glasgow School of Arts School of Design. His research centers on modern architecture and design for transport, pleasure, and hospitality, with a particular interest in the design history of modern merchant ships. He has published extensively on British and Danish design, and a chapter of his on Clyde-built ships of the 1920s and 1930s will be included in the forthcoming book, Art Deco in Scotland, to be published by Historic Environment Scotland in 2025. Given his extensive knowledge of the subject, Bruce also acted as an advisor for the v and impressive 2018 exhibition, Ocean Liners, Speed and Style, with which some of you may be familiar. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Faye Hamill, who will be speaking to us about ocean liners in interwar London, art and performance. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for the introduction and also for the invitation. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so yes, the seminar is going to be about the visual and theatrical cultures surrounding ocean liners in London in the early 20th century. Um, so I'm really interested in the idea of the liner as a stage. Um, Bruce is very interested in the idea of the liner as, as art gallery, which we might also be able to touch on. Um, so I think a ship is probably um, not something you would necessarily expect to find on stage very often, um, but actually there was a surprising number of plays, ballets, concerts, and musicals um, of the 20s and 30s that did feature ocean liners. Um, and I think one reason for this is that passenger ships were always associated with performance in various ways. Um, so that's partly about social performance, about the passenger decks as places to be seen and to exhibit your fashionability. Um, but it's partly also about the long tradition of entertainments taking place on board ship. So um, there's a long history of shipboard plays and concerts and variety shows, which might have been um, presented by the crew or got up by the passengers or presented by professional entertainers in different periods. And there might even be fashion shows. Um, so please enjoy this picture because it's one of several that I obtained at vast expense from uh, Getty Images for this talk. Um, so this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with three introductory slides. Um, that's the only part of this talk which you might have seen before if you've heard any of my other presentations. Um, the rest of it's all new material, so I would really welcome feedback and input. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a play by Sutton Vane, which I'm going to look at in a bit of detail. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk, look more briefly at a series of interconnected, um, more experimental performances by a group of artists associated with Osbert and Sir Chevrolet and Edith Sitwell. And then lastly, a short word about some commercial musical productions that also featured ocean liners. Um, and I've listed on this slide some of the um, questions that I'll be exploring. And I want to think about the way that ocean liner themes and visual motifs cross between high and popular cultural genres. 
Um, the last time I was here, which was a number of years ago now, I was talking about middle brow culture, and that's still one of my interests. So those um, interactions between different cultural levels. Um, okay, so the project, if you would like to know more about it and you're here in the room, I have got some of the bookmarks from my project, um, which I will leave around. Um, it's really about representations of passenger shipping in literature and culture. Um, and there turned out to be far more um, examples and a lot more material than I was expecting, so I'm trying to keep it under control. Um, and I'm really thinking about the way there's a dynamic between the more glamorous and alluring and innovative um, aspects of these ships and then the darker sides of their stories, for instance, in relation to war or forced migration or labour issues. Um, and if you visit this website, there are various things on there. Um, I, we made a short film from the project, and I've just done a couple of podcast recordings as well. Um, so I would like to start by defining this type of ship. Um, an ocean liner basically goes in a line from A to B. Um, so it's about crossing rather than cruising and sort of transit rather than tour. And it's built to withstand the high seas and to transport various categories of passengers and also goods in a space-efficient way. Whereas a purpose-built cruise ship is a completely different thing. Um, it's not carrying cargo or emigrants or budget travellers, so everyone's on holiday. So you have got the much higher superstructure, um, meaning that everyone's got a view, um, but also that the ship's going to have to travel more slowly in order to remain stable. And below the waterline, the cruise ship would have a much shallower profile so it could get into small historic ports. Um, and these categories are not entirely rigid because ocean liners could be converted into a cruising format and often were. Um, but it doesn't work the other way. So the QE2 here would be equally capable of a world tour or um, an Atlantic crossing, but that, that Saga cruise ship wouldn't do very well in, a, in an Atlantic storm, I think. This uh, is a brief chronology, um, starting with the engineering advances of the 19th century um, through to the first luxury superliners of the Edwardian era, um, and then the expansion of the market for liner travel in the interwar years as it became more accessible to middle-class travellers, and then the arrival of the jet age um, in the mid-century um, after the Second World War. And the dates I've marked in green, that's the, the scope of my own research project. Okay, so the first section. Um, this image shows one of several theatre bars from the late 1920s and early 1930s, um, which, as Bruce was pointing out to me, um, really evoked ocean liners in their styling. So the theatre goers might see um, something in the bar of what they were also seeing on stage in some of these plays. And this was one of a number of new theatres opened in the West End in this period with Art Deco styling. But the play I want to talk about... Um, Outward Bound. It was actually, it's not well remembered now, but it was really the sensation of London's West End um, in the autumn of 1923. And at this point, Sutton Vane wasn't very well known, and the play is quite an unusual fantasy drama, so he couldn't get a commercial producer to take it on. Um, and he mounted it, therefore, at, at the Everyman Theatre in Hampstead, which was a small independent theatre, and it had a summer company where the actors... Um, were looking for plays that, didn't, that required a small cast only and quite minimal scenery. So this play fit the bill um, because it's actually only got... Um, the, the passengers on this line of voyage, it turns out that there were only seven of them. They only gradually realised that. So the cast consists of the seven passengers, one crew member and one um, additional character that I'll tell you about. Um, and the sets, as you can see from this picture, could be done very simply. It was really just a bit of bar furniture and some doors opening out onto the deck. And this production transferred very quickly to the West End. Um, the next year it was equally successful on Broadway and then it was filmed. In terms of the staging, I'm showing here two images from the productions in larger theatres, which used more elaborate sets than that Everyman one. 
Um, and these are closer to the written stage directions that you've got on, this, on the slide here, which refer to a room which suggests rather than represents the lounge smoke room of a small ocean liner. This kind of implies that Vane is using the ship in a rather metaphorical way. Um, and indeed, I think the sea voyage in the play has real mythical resonance, as I will explain. But the scenes actually gain much of their effectiveness from clever use of the spatial affordances of the ship and of the stage as ship. Um, so the smoke room is the setting all the way through, um, but its atmosphere changes. Um, it gives onto the deck, and you can see in the directions here um, that the deck is represented by a centre door and behind it can be seen the liner railings. And at first it seems quite ordinary, so the passengers just wander out onto it to get away from each other um, or to wave goodbye to England. Um, but then as darkness falls, the totally unlit deck turns into a zone of menace and the passengers are really alarmed that they can't sense the sea beyond it. In the last line of these stage directions, it talks about four portholes. Um, and these look a bit strange in the pictures, if you can see, because they occur next to these doors to the open deck, and more usually portholes will be lower down um, in the ship. So they almost seem like kind of um, not realistic detailing, but self-conscious signals of a nautical setting, if you like. Um, Sutton Vane gently satirises the rituals of ocean liner travel, um, as in this scene between Tom, who's a kind of young man about town, and the Reverend Duke, who says, we must organise amongst ourselves. I've thought out lots of jolly little ideas. And he wants to get up a concert. Um, and Tom says, why? And he says, oh, it always is done, you know. Um, so Tom and Duke are these kind of seasoned travellers, one of them a bit weary of the whole thing. But the play also includes um, characters such as Mrs Midget. And you can see Mrs Midget in this picture. Um, a poor charwoman, obviously out of place in these strange surroundings. And then there's this snobbish um, lady, Mrs Clive and Banks, who says, tell somebody to take the good woman back to her proper place immediately. She's been wandering, she's on the wrong deck, she's in the wrong class. And Mrs. Cliveden Banks is horrified to hear that the vessel only has one class. And this would indeed have been unusual on an interwar liner. Um, and then she asks, this is in the bottom line of the text on the screen, how am I to know who are the ladies and gentlemen and who are not? Um, so clearly Vane drawing attention here to the, the performative and fluid nature of class identities and really questioning those kind of hierarchies which structured ocean liner travel as well as other aspects of society, but perhaps were even more rigid and even more visible on the ship. So the passengers at first imagine that they see the things you would expect to see, um, on, and they only gradually realise that most of the familiar elements of a shipboard environment are missing or distorted. So they can't find an engine room or even any sailors, um, and they realise that there are no lights out on the deck. This image comes from... Um, the Theatre Royal Workington, which, if you look at their excellent website, they have an archive of all their productions back to 1936. Um, and this production, of course, it's a little deviation from my London um, theme, but I just wanted to show the way that they use the dark deck um, and the way that attention is focused towards that kind of menacing space out there. Um, and the bit of dialogue there is where the characters realise there's nothing, nothing anywhere, nobody... And at the end, the character, Duke, says, I'm not even certain that we're moving. Um, so this is an extreme version of an experience which would actually be quite usual during days at sea. Um, so obviously, if you're travelling on a train or a car or even a coastal steamer, you can see your progress against the landscape, whereas, you know, in mid-ocean, you know, you might seem to be static amidst this unchanging vista of water. And the character of Tom, um, his observations about the ship and the passengers gradually um, lead him to deduce that all of them are actually dead. He's the first one to twig, and he asks the steward where they're sailing to, and the reply comes, heaven, sir, and hell, too, it's the same place, you see. So we can read this steamer journey as purgatory or limbo. Um, the steward, um, a kind of Charon figure, 
um, informs the uh, passengers that at the end of the journey, someone called the examiner, so this is the final character, will come on board and dispatch each passenger to their, their personal destination. So even though Sutton Vane ship is not divided into different classes of accommodation, it has this much more powerful mechanism for sorting the passengers. And then as they arrive in port, um, the Reverend Duke proclaims, we've stopped for good now, this is the judgment. And Tom objects, no, it can't be, here in the smoke room of a liner. Um, and I was thinking that the kind of incongruity of that setting for the final judgment would surely have reminded um, people of the scenes aboard the Titanic, you know, not so very long um, earlier, um, with liner passengers in evening dress, you know, suddenly meeting their ends. And Duke says, why shouldn't it be here in the smoke room of a liner? Have any of us really troubled very much to think where and how and when it might be? Um, and then more broadly, all the meditations on death in the play would have did strike a chord with audiences who had recently lived through World War I. And then um, in the right-hand text, this reviewer for the illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News um, says that since the play is about death, he says, at first, the thought of the liner appears gross, grotesquely material. Um, but it really becomes clear, I think, that the whole interest of this play is in the interaction between the material and the immaterial. And just lastly on this play, there are two passengers who are not forced to disembark, um, the halfways, and they've attempted suicide and they're suspended between life and death. So their role on board actually similar to stowaways, their, name are not, their names aren't on the passenger list and they keep trying to hide from everybody else. Um, and once all the others have left, um, Henry goes out on deck and he manages to break back through into the world of the living. Um, from where he calls to Anne, I've come to fetch you home, dear. And that's what's shown in that illustration from the sketch. So while the space of the ship is thoroughly uncanny, um, the ending of the play does hold out hope of finding a true home, not just to Anne and Henry, but also in heaven to some of the characters, Mrs Midget and Tom, who turns out to be her son. Um, and Mrs. Cliveden Banks, on the other hand, is forced to move back in with her despised husband and learn to be a good wife. Um, so, yeah, obviously place is, is no longer determined by social prestige at the end, but my moral calibre. So I'm going to move on to this section on the more experimental performances. So while Outward Band started in a small independent venue, which was the Everyman, and then transferred to a commercial theatre... All of these productions that I'm going to mention um, in this section stayed in the smaller theatres. So I'm really just wanting to um, talk about a loose London-based network of artists, photographers, writers, performers um, and composers. And most of them were associated with what we now remember as the Bloomsbury Group um, or with a set that centred on the Sitwell siblings. Um, and among the Sitwell's closest associates were the composer Constant Lambert and also Cecil Beaton, in, who's in this picture, um, mostly remembered, of course, for his photography, but also worked in painting and stage design. Um, Osbert and Sir Chevrel Sitwell collaborated on this play that's set during a transatlantic crossing, and Beaton designed the stage sets um, and also this lovely cover for the published um, volume. This is showing the ship's cocktail bar, but it's kind of curiously open to the ocean with the waves um, lapping around. Um, and in this published volume, Osbert Sitwell added an extended prose preface um, in which he describes the liner as an achievement of this age and with all its absurdities, one of its greatest creations. Um, the play was staged under the title of First Class Passengers Only, um, and it was at the Arts Theatre, which is still there in the picture. Um, and it's quite a small theatre, that's why I've included the, the seating plan. Um, and it was only ran for five nights in November 1927. This theatre was operating as a private members club. It had only been open for six months at this time, so it was able to put on um, unlicensed plays such as this one. Um, and the premiere of the Sitwell's play did attract considerable press coverage, even though it was in this small venue, because of their, their celebrity. So this review from the Times talks about an air of whispering in corners, 
Um, and certainly a lot of the lines of dialogue do depend on the audience's knowing um, like the intellectual fads of the period or the, the sort of foibles of the um, contemporary playwrights and the society figures. So the character of Lady Flintye, for instance, is based on the prominent hostess Sybil Colfax. And the reviewer describes this at the end of the text there, uh, a strange erratic evening, something between a review without music and a venomous charade. I think that's kind of spot on, actually. Um, the Sitwells generally in their work draw on the uh, conventions of popular entertainment, and it's often in a mocking or parodic way, but the effect is that I think their experimental and, and modernist pieces do sometimes draw closer to the stage effects of music hall and review and operetta. Um, in the middle there, the Times reviewer points to a brilliant piece of female impersonation. And again, that the very camp atmosphere of this play really aligns it with other work by the Sitwells. So this is the second scene, which opens in mid-conversation. So in the right-hand part, you've got the dialogue. The captain, Captain Starboard, um, says to a character called Lady Arabella, who's nicknamed Zoe, he says, some queer things happen on a ship like this. It takes all sorts to make a shipload. Um, and she replies, how thrilling it must be if there's a murderer on board. It's never been as good as that yet, though once we had a fraudulent financier on board dressed as a woman, it was all I could do to hold the sailors in. Um, so this speech refers to the, the famed um, shipboard tolerance of homosexuality and camp styles. Um, and the reason the on-stage effect was comic is because one of Starboard's auditors here um, is a male passenger dressed up as a Russian countess as part of a practical joke. So where it says count there, that, that's that character. Um, and he cries, oh, how horrible. To me, there is something sacred about a woman. And the captain patiently explains, yes, Countess, but this wasn't a woman. It was a man dressed up as a woman. Um, and the maritime historian Joe Stanley um, points out that in the interwar and mid-century decades, um, quote, shipping lines paid their hotel side shipboard workers to help produce a ludic atmosphere for the passengers. And she talks about the drinking and the fancy dress parties as mutual delusion and as informal theatre. So this comes back to the, the idea of, you know, the social aspect of the liner as a form of performance. And All at Sea is really all about this. It contains all these elements. Um, but I think the light and delusion do sometimes tip over into menace as the ship becomes a space of misrule in the play. Um, another scene takes place in the cocktail bar. Um, this image um, from the same month as the performance of the play shows this, the Sitwell brothers learning about cocktails with the famous um, Harry Craddock at the Savoy Hotel. And in the play, um, the social climber Lady Flintye is tricked by her fellow passengers into drinking cocktails for the first time. And she then strikes up a conversation with the barman that you have here. Um, she assumes this is the bartender Lulu, but it's actually a famous pianist called Malakoff, who she really wanted to impress, who's just dressed up as the barman. It's the kind of thing that happens in this play. What an interesting life you must have, Mr. Lulu. Interesting but intricate, milady. It must be so extraordinary going backwards and forwards, better than going round and round, milady. And do you always recognise your customers, Mr. Lulu? Never till I've seen them twice over. And then meanwhile, the real barman returns, and Lady Flintye is horrified when she looks up and sees two Lulus. So the other characters have imposed an entirely false perceptual world on her. Um, she thinks, because she's seeing double, that she's much more drunk than she really is. Um, and then when she realises there actually are two, two men there, she doesn't know which is the real Lulu. So the affordances of the ocean liner setting allow the Sitwells to present an extreme version of the idea of identities as, as socially constructed and, and mutable. So in the scene I discussed before, there's the middle-class man dressed as an aristocratic woman, and now we've got a passenger um, masquerading as a member of the crew. I also like the backwards and forwards and round and round because it, it sort of evokes the sense of frantic and yet circular movement which pervades the play and which relates to the idea of you know, passengers walking round and round the deck and not able to get off. In his preface... Um, Sitwell writes, the ship is filled in this miniature of the age with a crowd of people engaged in pointless movement, conveyed in suffocating and unnecessary luxury, 
from place to place by an army of sweating and grimy workers. I'm not sure if he's here making a sort of point in support of the workers or if he's saying, oh, I can smell them from here. It's, it's not quite clear what kind of critique this is, but certainly there's a certain amount of horror at the pointlessness of the whole thing. Um, and Stickwell, you see here, had just travelled on board the Majestic, so I'd imagine that's the one he had in mind when writing the play. The crew members, apart from Lulu, are not presented on the stage, but they are referred to, and their workspaces get invaded by the passengers. So um, there's reference in this speech by a character called Clarissa to two of them in the photographer's dark room hiding from Lady Flintye. Um, and then she says, she got into the engine room just now and made a dreadful scene in front of the stokers. Such bad form. Um, this play is full of references to other contemporary plays, so I would think that's a reference to Eugene O'Neill's um, The Hairy Ape, um, which shows a first-class passenger insisting on visiting the stoke hole and then falling into hysterics at the scene. So comparing Outward Bound with All at Sea, I'd say that in the static space of the stage, um, both plays manage to evoke a sense of movement, but also a sense of complete lack of progress. But in other respects, I think these plays form a really marked um, contrast. Um, in certain vein, the ocean line is a place of reckoning where everyone confronts their fate, and the play seems kind of haunted by narratives of shipwreck. Whereas for the Sitwells, the ocean liner is an extension of the London drawing room. Um, and by boarding, I think the members of high society attempt to extend their influence until they're even colonising the ocean. So I want to now mention several works in different genres that are connected to All at Sea through nautical themes, but also through the network I mentioned before. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I thought I'll bring it all together and then I'll show you the pictures of all of these productions. So a lot of these images come from an exhibition that was held in Glasgow a few months ago, which was one of the inspirations for this talk. Um, the uh, stage and screen, it was called. You can find a list of all the works in that exhibition on, on the uh, Huntarian um, website. So starting with Sir Chevrolet Sitwell's poem, um, it's about the major port city of Rio Grande in Brazil. Constant Lambert's musical setting of it became his best-known work, um, and it circulated widely in, in broadcast and live performance and print forms. Um, and the published score had a cover by John Banting, um, who was a painter and um, stage and book designer. And then next, this piece turned into a ballet by Frederick Ashton, with a new title of A Day in a Southern Port. And the sets and costumes for this were by the London-based painter, printmaker, and book artist, Edward Burrough. Ashton also produced another new jazz ballet featuring more ships um, called High Yellow. Um, and this one maybe has sort of problematic uh, racial reference in the title, but it had very interesting designs um, by the London artist, Vanessa Bell, um, and the ballet dancer and designer, William Chappell. And then the culmination of all of this was a season of performances by the Camargo Society. Um, that was formed in 1930, just after the collapse of the Ballet Russe. Um, and they had, in this season, there were 14 short ballets, um, including High Yellow and A Day in a Southern Port, and also one called Fete Polonaise. Um, that one didn't have any nautical themes, but I've just mentioned it because it was designed by Edmund Dulac, who was fresh from his commission to um, design interiors on board Canadian Pacific's Empress of Britain. So this is where we get to the pictures. Um, the Sitwell poem talks about ships riding at anchor, um, till the ships at anchor hear this enchantment. So I think that line may have been the inspiration for Banting's um, cover for the score, which kind of shows the shape of the liner's um, bow in, in triplicate there, because you actually have... Um, oh, I'm supposed to point with this something. Um, the actual ship with the mooring lines there, and then there's the building, which is also in that triangular shape. And I'm not too sure what the black triangle is, but it seems to kind of reiterate the shape of the ship there and indicate its relationship to the port city. Um, and this other image is a bit of a side note, um, but Banting also designed a jacket for um, a book published by the Hogarth Press, which is also a novel about ocean liners. Um, 
So these things are all connected. This is the back cloth for the ballet, A Day in a Southern Port. Um, this was first used at the Savoy Theatre performance in 1931. And here, as in that um, book cover I was looking at just a moment ago, you can see the ocean liner is in the distance. Um, but it still seems to draw the eye, I think. Um, and the Savoy Theatre was a Victorian one that was built by Richard Doyley Cart, who also built the Savoy, the the Savoy Hotel next door. Um, and at the time when A Day in a Southern Port opened at the Savoy, it had just been remodelled with a new Art Deco interior. And you might notice that this back cloth is a bit loose. Um, the production also featured quite provocative costumes by Borough. So it was all a bit shocking, I think, to audiences that were used to ballerinas in, in tutus, because it's all a bit, a bit suggestive. Um, these are some of the costumes. Um, the review in The Guardian... Um, here wondered if the visual aspects of the ballet had been inspired by Marseille and Toulon, um, where Ashton, Lambert and Burra had all spent time. So I think the idea of the southern port is getting a bit detached from Brazil and it's becoming more of a general sailor town idea. Um, and then Burra's design was maintained for the 1932 performances as part of the Camargo Society season, which also ran at the Savoy Theatre. So see that costume in the middle? You can then see William Chappell wearing it on stage. Um, a couple of these images are from later performances in 1935 in which he um, danced alongside Margot Fontaine. And that um, actually marked the start of a long affair between Margot Fontaine and Constant Lambert. Um, Chappell himself soon began designing for the stage. So like everybody I've mentioned, he crossed over different creative genres, but he's the only one who is both a performer and a designer. So he designed costumes and then he wore them to dance, which is quite unusual, I think. Um, he, um, yeah, designed these costumes for the high yellow ballet in the left-hand image. And in the right-hand image, you can see him wearing them at the top there. And the little description from the programme note gives you somewhat of an idea of what this ballet is about, um, some sort of queer goings on with sailors and their lovers in different ports. Um, William Chappell also designed a back cloth for this ballet, but it was rejected in favour of the one by Vanessa Bell that I had on my opening slide. Um, the Camargo Society had strong links with Bloomsbury. Um, Bell's design here, um, it has a sort of resemblance perhaps to a kind of holiday brochure atmosphere. Um, her biographer quotes Bell as saying, I simply did sea with boats and huge tropical flowers and a striped awning and a cocktail bar, which are slightly mystifying because <laughs> I can't really see those things in the image and it looks much more like the deck of a ship um, with the funnels and so on. And it foregrounds the liner more than the description suggests or, or than the content of the ballet might, might warrant. So lastly, this is a very much shorter section on musical theatre. Um, this shows the London impresario Charles Cochran with Noel Coward. Um, they just arrived from New York on the Berengaria and they were met by several of the dancers who worked with Cochran. Um, so this photograph really captures the idea of the liner as stage because it's so very staged itself. And there's another one in the Getty archive in which the six people are in a different order. So they clearly kind of walked up and down the deck a few times for the benefit of the press photographer. Um, so the arrival is part of the promotional activity for Coward and Cochrane's current productions. And Coward is strongly associated with images of shipboard glamour, but it wasn't till the 1960s that he actually began to represent ocean liners in his work, um, instance, for instance, in the musical Sail Away. Um, and the only piece from his interwar heyday that actually features an ocean liner is um, Cavalcade, which was a collaboration with Charles Cochrane. And it was a kind of historical spectacular. So it presented a panorama of events from 1899 through to 1930 that was shown in terms of their effects on a couple of English families. And Coward recalled in his autobiography that while he was planning the play, my mind was full of visions, events grand and portentous, battles, sieges, earthquakes, revolutions, and shipwrecks. 
But he couldn't think of a story until he was looking at a back issue of the Illustrated London News and he found a picture of a troop ship leaving for the Boer War. He says, the moment I saw it, I knew that I'd found what I wanted. And he strung the story onto a series of popular tunes which were intended to evoke events that had happened within living memory. Cavalcade was staged at Drury Lane, which was one of the largest West End theatres. That seats over 2,000. So I'm thinking in this space, the Ocean Liner could be presented in a very different way from how it was in those smaller venues I was talking about before. And you can get a sense, it's a, not a great photograph, but the um, sense of the ship's side looming um, over the stage and over the crowd of people on it, as opposed to those tiny casts of the other plays. Um, Cavalcade's 22 sets and hundreds of costumes were by the leading designer Gladys Calthrop, who'd worked with Coward since the start of their careers, um, beginning with his first major play, The Vortex, which present was presented at none other than the Everyman Theatre Hampstead. And she remembered that there was nowhere to paint the sets for that other than outside on Hampstead High Street. Um, whereas by the time they got to Cavalcade, she had a lot more scope and a lot more space. So the popular imagery of ships features twice in Cavalcade. Um, this image shows Calthrop's design for the dockside scene in which two characters are embarking for South Africa on a liner that has been converted into a troop ship. And then there's a later scene set on the deck of an Atlantic liner. Um, the honeymooners, Edith and Edward, discuss whether, given how happy they are, they would mind if they died that night. And Edith declares, this is our moment, complete and heavenly. I'm not afraid of anything, um, which is lucky because she just takes up her cloak from the rail and it reveals a life belt with SS Titanic on it. So that's the end of them. Um, and in the next scene, which is set in 1914, um, on the date Britain declared war on Germany, you have Edward's mother, Jane, commenting, Edward missed this anyhow. At least he died when he was happy before the world broke over his head. So the Titanic in this play stands for the, the lost pre-war world of romance, um, but also its sinking anticipates the coming conflict. And those are meanings that have been reiterated in so many later um, cultural representations. Lastly, um, Anything Goes. This is probably the best-known London stage show featuring an ocean liner. Um, it had musical numbers by Coward's friend Cole Porter, and it's set aboard a ship called the SS America. Um, it had first been performed in, on Broadway in 1934, and for that production, um, there had to be some last-minute changes. Um, it was initially going to feature a shipwreck which was treated farcically, um, but in view of the disastrous fire on board the SS Morrow Castle a few weeks before the show was due to open, they hastily rewrote it as a romantic comedy. And Charles Cochrane then bought the rights for a London production, and the dialogue and songs were altered for the British audience. Um, that was done by P.G. Woodhouse, who wrote the book for both the British and the American um, productions. Woodhouse actually set a couple of his own novels on Atlantic liners too, um, and uh, I've noticed that literary and theatre historians have separately read his novels and Anything Goes in the same terms, so suggesting that they use the ocean liner as a carnivalesque setting, which you know, offers these possibilities for presenting disruption of hierarchy and creative misrule. And this reviewer in the sphere suggests that the design of Anything Goes is so up-to-date that it almost seems futuristic. He says that Cochrane shows us costumes which may be worn in 1937, remembering it's only 1935, um, and an ocean liner which can beat the Normandy, which had just taken her maiden voyage at the time. Um, and the Sphere's photographs give us a sense of that London production. Um, the left-hand image shows how the staging necessarily distorted the spatial realities of liners, um, because you've got a third-class cabin here with two bunk beds that's apparently right next door to a luxurious suite that an aristocratic character occupies. Um, and the right-hand picture with this big two-tier set and the crowd scene sort of exemplifies what I was saying before about the different way the ships could be presented in these big stages with the kind of um, rather spectacular scenery. So concluding this, as we move from Outward Bound and All at Sea in the 1920s through to Cavalcade and Anything Goes in the 30s, I think that ocean liners on stage shift from being intimate drawing room spaces to these elaborate and vertically imposing structures 
So you have Vane and Sitwell using small casts of characters to show how individuals are changed by their shipboard experience, and Coward and Porter um, contrasting, presenting the liner on a grand scale as a setting for tragedy or spectacular set pieces. Um, whereas the Vane and Sitwell plays show only one small part of the ship and represent the rest of it just through report. In between these two types of drama, there was a sequence of avant-garde performances in which ocean liners really provided visual and sensual stimulation. Um, so I think these modernist liners, which were often seen in the distance, um, really primarily represent an interface between port and seafaring life. So they're not all-encompassing settings so much as elements in a sensory world of, of colour and sound and movement. So I'm hoping that the talk's given a sense of how pervasive the motif of passenger shipping was in all kinds of creative output in interwar London. And this slide is just to indicate the afterlives um, on film and in print of some of those stage performances that I've been talking about. Um, and they do continue to circulate um, in various media, and some of them do continue to be staged. So I just wanted to finish with these thanks and also a list of things that I didn't directly quote from, which I did draw on in my talk. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faye. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, back in uh, 2010, um, I uh, was invited uh, to a seminar at uh, Strathclyde University, where Faye was then working. Uh, she had just completed at that time her wonderful book on the subject of sophistication and how this had gone from being a negative term in the 19th century associated with sophistry to one that was a positive term associated with the bright young things and the modern fashionable culture that was emerging at that time in London's West End theatre and media scene. And uh, it, I've been in awe of Faye ever since. Uh, her work combines all the sorts of subjects that I find fascinating and I'm very curious about. Uh, the theatre, uh, popular entertainment, uh, literature, the people who were in the media between the wars and now ocean liners as well. So, and, and, and you know, looking at them from all different sorts of angles that have not been really uh, covered before, uh, at least not to my knowledge. Um, I've probably got, after that wonderfully erudite presentation, a few uh, possibly rather trite uh, marks by way of response. Um, the first is, I feel that I'm very lucky. Um, I'm going to be 50 years old already next month. But what that means is that when I was in my 20s, back in the 1990s and still a student, um, I was living at a time when the interwar era was still in living memory. And actually, when I was an undergraduate student, I wrote a book on Glasgow cinemas, and some of the people who'd actually owned cinema circuits were still alive, and architects who designed these places. And then when I went on to do my PhD, um, people who were involved, which was about uh, the architecture of entertainment between the two world wars in Britain, um, again, several of the architects and designers were around. And one of the people I interviewed for that in the late 90s was a wonderful gentleman called Michael Egan, who in the late 20s and early 30s, as a young man, um, about the age I was when I was doing the interviewing as a new graduate, had worked in London for a decorating firm called Marc-Henri et Lavardé. Um, Marc-Henri Lévy and his partner Gaston Lavardé had come over from Paris uh, to decorate... Uh, new theatres and restaurants and nightclubs and cocktail bars and other entertainments in the style of the recent Exposition des Arts Décoratifs. 
And having decorated one new West End theatre, they then became the go-to architects for pretty much the whole lot. So I think of the you know, big handful of new theatres opened in the late 20s and early 30s that were added to London's West End. I think they did pretty much all of them except the Savoy, which was by Basil Leonides. And of course, these were buildings that introduced Art Deco and what we would now retrospectively perhaps call the ocean liner style to wide audiences and the general public several crucial years before British liner companies actually started decorating ships in that manner, you know, un under the British flag, um, the Empress of Japan and the Empress of Canada were kind of pioneers. Um, one of the other people I interviewed, and I'm very, very glad I did, was a lady called Doris Thompson, who was the honorary chairperson of Blackpool Pleasure Beach. But in the 1930s, uh, she and her husband, who was the chairman and owner of the Pleasure Beach, Leonard Thompson, had traveled very regularly across the Atlantic in order to visit Luma Park and Coney Island and the various American manufacturers of amusement equipment in order to buy the latest stuff for the next season in Blackpool. And they always went on the newest ships on early voyages. And so Doris Thompson, had been on one of the first voyages, if not the first voyage, of the Normandy. And she could remember it absolutely vividly. Now, imagine me in my mid-twenties going to her private apartment in the casino building at the Pleasure Beach, the round one designed by Joseph Emberton at the entrance, and finding this very grand Lancastrian lady seated at an Emberton-designed dining table in this beautiful Art Deco modern room. And it just being like going into a kind of time warp and then her recounting to me in loving detail about crossing the Atlantic on the Normandy. And one of the things that really sticks in my mind about what she said was just how much of a stage set that ship was. That it really not to be dressed up in the fanciest clothes was to let the side down. And, of course, the worst of it was that it rolled very, very badly. This was out of season, I presume, so it was a fairly uh, rough passage. The Normandy was not a good ship in which to be seasick because you were on display. It was very open plan, and if some of you who perhaps went to the Ocean Liners exhibition will remember the fantastic Jean Dunant panel of sports, the great big two-deck high gilded panel that was borrowed from uh, the French Lines uh, archives. You know, that just gives a little impression of what the Normandy's interiors were like. So liners, as Faye said, were like stage sets. They were very much like stage sets sets. Uh, with other hats on, I uh, have uh, significant involvement with the shipping industry, and I often go and visit ships under construction or refit in shipyards, and it's fascinating because the moment a passenger ship comes into a, a yard, um, all the surface finishes which the public generally see are quickly taken apart. Suspended ceilings are dismantled to reveal vast amounts of cabling and ducting, wall panelling is taken down, and then the real work begins. And it's actually very late in a refit process as kind of the last thing that all of these final finishes are put back. So when we think about liners on board, you know, we, we, we often think about them as you know, the character of the ship is the decor of its interior. The Queen Mary's beautiful saloons are what makes the Queen Mary, what we remember of the Normandy, you know, it, it's these spectacular interiors. But actually, all of these finishes were incredibly ephemeral and closer to the nature of stage sets than one might imagine. Moving to Faye's wonderful presentation, 
Um, one of the things that struck me was the variety of types of theater performance that were uh, described. And of course, this was fitting into a, a rapidly expanding entertainment scene in London's West End. Uh, not only did one have existing West End theatres, new West End theatres built for reviews and uh, other types of performance, um, a vast number of new nightclubs and, and other attractions with stage entertainment, but above all, in the late 20s, the, the talking cinema came along, and so uh, in the late 20s, big new palatial movie houses like the Plaza in Regent Street and the Carlton in Haymarket and the Empire in Leicester Square were constructed, bigger than the biggest of the theatres, and often offering a lot more space and comfort. And then later in the 1930s, when the economy recovered after the Great Depression, there came the, the modern uh, super cinemas, such such as the Odeon and the Warner in Leicester Square. So the depictions of liners on stage in their various forms fit into a much wider picture with regard to uh, West End entertainment. And uh, as a non-expert on this side, uh, I speculate that uh, in the theatres, we've seen the kind of off-Broadway equivalent theatres, the small arts venues uh, aiming at niche audiences, tended to put on plays which seemed to depict liners in a kind of world-weary way as being uh, you know, part of that kind of wider phenomenon of the intellectuals pitying the nouveau riche for their vacuous lives lived amongst superficial luxury. Whereas um, I'm guessing in the new super cinemas that on film, liners were depicted probably as being much more um, aspirational, I imagine, rather than there being this kind of uh, cultural critique that's, that's sort of very typical of, of, of critiques of uh, mass culture from the, the mid-19th century onward to the present. Um, I was... Uh, extremely interested also in the Sitwell's uh, staging instructions for All at Sea. Um, one of the things that was uh, pointed out in the stage instructions was that the cocktail bar should be Tudor half timber. Now, this was a style that was briefly very, very popular in the 1920s. Um, I think possibly its popularity was stimulated to an extent by the very positive uh, reception given to the new Liberty department store, which incidentally was finished using ship timbers that had been recycled from dismantled uh, British warships from you know, the, the, the days of sail. But anyway, numerous new hotels, um, such as the Park Lane Hotel and the Grosvenor House, had dining rooms and smoking saloons that were in this neo-Tudor style. And the Liverpool decorators, Heat and Tab, who specialized in designing ship saloons, designing and making ship saloons. They were a kind of one-stop shop, particularly supplying these to the Harland and Wolfe shipyard in Belfast, uh, particularly liked the Neo-Tudor style. Now, Harland and Wolfe was the British licensee of Boermeister and Wayne, the Danish uh, maker of marine diesel engines. And so pretty much all the ships that Harland and Wolf built in the interwar era were motor ships with these Boermeister and Wayne engines, as opposed to being steam turbine ships, which were much more typical of British passenger ship design and construction at that time. Of course, steam turbine ships are incredibly smooth and silent. They're a genre that's all but disappeared because they weren't, uh, by modern standards to tip particularly fuel efficient, but I'm 
just about old enough to have experienced a few steam turbine ocean liners now scrapped actually at sea when they were at the ends of their lives as budget cruise ships. And once you've been on a steam turbine ship, it, nothing else is quite the same. They're simply effortless, silent, smooth, amazing. Burmeister and Wayne diesel engines are anything but silent, especially the sort uh, made in the 1920s and with the engine mountings at that time. So one has to imagine these neo-Tudor interiors vibrating and with this rumbling sound coming through the floor along with the creaking and the ship movements. Even the Harland and Wolfe built Liverpool Belfast Ulster Steamship Company overnight ships, vessels like the Ulster Monarch, had neo-Tudor first-class saloons. They also had prison cells and police cabins in third class in order to maintain order during the marching season, but that's another story. The Liverpool-Belfast route could be quite a wild one in every sense. So neo-Tudor interiors, of course, they also went against progressive ideas of logic in terms of good taste. Why on earth one would have a neo-Tudor saloon on a ship, especially a modern ship? And I guess, therefore, that there's a kind of ridiculous element about specifying the most illogical type of design that had been prevalent in the immediate preceding era in order to make a kind of point about the facile nature of these types of environments. Then we have, uh, as my last uh, observation, uh, my great admiration for Gladys Calthrop's set designs for Cavalcade. That uh, stage uh, design, the uh, act drop, uh, is an incredibly accurate rendering of a castle line mail cargo and passenger ship of around the time of the turn of the century. Uh, the Castle Line was a Scottish-owned shipping company, and the Boer War was extremely good for its business. They made huge amounts of money transporting British troops and munitions to South Africa, and the owners became so prosperous as a result of this that they bought Glen Lyon in Scotland and then spent an absolute fortune beautifying it. So I sometimes go, Hill walking and Glen Lyon uh, is a sort of starting point for getting up to some of the mountains, and it's still an extremely beautiful estate. And one looks at the arts and crafts houses that were built, and it was all on the back of Boer War money. And there was one of the castle ships, very accurately, at least the midship section of it, pretty accurately uh, depicted on the London stage. So full of fascination. Thank you so much, Faye. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm now very briefly, as a small indulgence, this is the kind of what you call the supporting feature in the cinema, a short to end with so that you feel you're getting value for money. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about my own forthcoming research. Um, I'm very uh, proud and touched and honored and delighted to have been the recipient of a research grant uh, just uh, announced uh, a couple of months ago from the Paul Mellon Center, to whom huge thanks in order to carry out an investigation into a subject that I've wanted to examine for a very long time. And that is the question of how modern art was commissioned on British ships between the 1930s and the 1960s. So I'm kind of covering a similar period uh, as Faye is in terms of performance, but I'm interested in what shipping lines commissioned to put on the bulkheads of their vessels. Um, usually when I do uh, lectures and talks and symposia, I'm speaking on work that I've done. So this is very unusual in that it's speculative. I've not begun yet. So I won't be able to tell you terribly much, which is perhaps lucky because we can get through it uh, faster. Um, but I'm going to start at, at what I think is an interesting pivot point joining my forthcoming research on to phase current and recent research. This is a painting um, on board the Queen Mary. 
the great Cunard White Star liner, biggest ship in the world when it was built, the fastest too, constructed by John Browns at Clyde Bank and belatedly entered into service in 1936. It then had a stellar career in peace and war and peace again. And in the mid-1960s, rather than going for scrap, very, very fortunately for all of us, it was bought by the city of Long Beach. And it, since the mid-60s, it's been moored there, and it later opened as a hotel and tourist attraction. It's the most remarkable uh, thing. I had the good fortune of visiting it for the first time in my life last November, and it was an extraordinary experience. This painting by Dame Laura Knight uh, stands behind a kind of Starbucks-type coffee counter just off the promenade an ad deck in what used to be one of the gallery spaces, and it's just there on the wall as if it was the most normal thing in the world. But really, it, it's one of a, a very big collection of pieces of British art of various different types that were commissioned by Cunard for the ship. This is showing a scene backstage in a London music hall. It's uh, taking a rather different angle from the auditorium uh, vantage points used by, for example, Walter Sickert in the late 19th century. Here we're backstage peering out at the audience. So this is kind of the opposite of the stage set's face showed where you've got the position of the audience and you're looking through a ship interior to a glimpse of the sea. This is you know, sort of this. still this sense of a glimpse and it's between the opening curtains and it's, you know, the show is being prepared and it's about to start. The Queen Mary, because of when it was built, I guess, contains rather a lot of pieces of artwork that one way or another depict entertainment. Uh, that kind of indicates, I guess, that for a British shipping company uh, trying to appeal to an American audience, that the London stage was considered important and that this was an uncontroversial or non-controversial aspect of British culture that could be made appealing to American passengers passengers on their way to the UK. My interest in art and ships goes back quite a long way, though I'm half Danish, and I first actually noticed art of any kind in any context crossing backwards and forwards over the North Sea on ships such as this. This is a dining saloon that I ate in many, many times over the years in the 70s, 80s, and into the early 1990s and I love the big panel on the wall. Uh, this is a, a Norwegian ship of the Fred Olsen line. I also sometimes went to Norway. Um, a panel actually made in the 1930s for an earlier vessel of the same name that was lost in the Second World War by a Norwegian artist called Åge Storstein. Um, I mentioned that because this cubist artist, who was, I think, trained under Brack, um, was painting in this manner contemporaneously with Picasso. And so this panel is kind of, you know, from the period when Cubism was modern and fashionable. And yet there it was in the tourist class dining saloon on the Black Prince, right next to a pair of two-seater tables so that people could squirt tomato soup and grapefruit and whatever on it. You know, it was just there. But a rather amazing piece of work, I think, especially on a North Sea passenger ship. Of course, in Norway, the, the Olsen family are big collectors of art, and uh, they, they gathered, I think, the biggest collection of Munch paintings, for instance. Other ships I sailed on as a child, this is the, the Tor Scandinavia, one of two very fine ferries operating between southern England, Harwich and Felixstowe and Gothenburg, owned by a Swedish ship owner, the Salane Group. Again, they were big art collectors, and this vessel and its sister ship were absolutely full of works by different English and Swedish artists contemporaneous with its construction in the 1970s. Um, so art and ships is, is sort of something I've had in my mind for a very, very long time. And I'm rather excited now that I'm going to get to uh, write on this subject. My most recent works, well, one is uh, about the 
construction of the interiors, the, the commissioning and construction of the interiors of uh, passenger ships built in the Clyde between the latter 19th century and uh, the 1960s. This kind of ends with the Queen Elizabeth II. And as has been mentioned at the beginning, I'm, uh, I've been working on a book on Art Deco in Scotland. So in some ways, the work on art on board ships develops from both of, of these projects, and it will be able to put to uh, use uh, a contextual knowledge already gained. Um, the, the Ocean Liners exhibition, which I, I think was absolutely wonderful, the lead curator was Ghislaine Wood, um, who has done so many terrific exhibitions on the decorative arts and you know, all sorts of aspects of uh, design and life in the early 20th century. This included several significant artworks. I mentioned the Normandy panel which are, of course, not particularly relevant to my forthcoming work. But there was this lovely big panel from the Orient liner, Oronce of 1950, called the English Pub. And that's one of several pieces that are in the p and Heritage Collection. So they, are, they rescued uh, several of the important artworks on ships uh, that they had owned before these vessels left the fleet. So that will be an important source of material for my, my research. It fits into a wider picture of various different books that have been produced on a, a kind of expanded notion of modern art in Britain in the into war era. There are just three that uh, I thought were particularly interesting and in various ways relevant to what I'm going to try and do. Um, it's going to be a question of piecing together a jigsaw of uh, fragments of evidence, as all of these things are. I think a very important figure was Sir Colin Anderson, a director of the Orient Line, the family shipping company operating between Britain and Australia, um, later its chairman and also chairman of the Tate Gallery in London. By all accounts, uh, a very charming and cultivated gentleman, and also one of these people who seem to know everybody in the London cultural scene. So I'm trying to find uh, correspondence and the many articles that Sir Colin wrote, which actually tell quite a lot about his uh, thinking, but as I say, early days yet. Now, we're coming to the end. The Queen Mary. I visited that ship in November. Um, it is the great surviving, almost entirely intact artifact of British Ocean Liner at its absolute best, at its ap apotheosis. The top picture on the left here was taken by my Scottish grandfather, A. Ernest Glenn, in May 1936, when the Queen Mary left the John Brown shipyard to go on its trials. Uh, the bottom picture was taken by me in Long Beach last November, and I can tell you that when I first set eyes on the ship, I had a lump in my throat. It really is a most incredible and affecting object, and you know, when you see that hull with the millions of rivets all put in by hand. Quite an extraordinary human achievement, especially when one considers it was all designed with slide rules and you know, quite simple mathematical equipment relative to the advanced computing that naval architects can use today. Inboard, it contains the most extraordinary collection of uh, art and sculpture, uh, really giving a, 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 a broad cross-section of conservative modern taste, if you like, in the 1930s. So here we've got the uh, what was the first class, or as Cunard called it, cabin class lounge with works by Alfred Oakley and Gilbert Bays. Here we have the first class smoking saloon with these two very large, quite surrealistic panels by Edward Wadsworth. Uh, here we have the first uh, cabin class dining saloon with works by MacDonald Gill, Philip Connard, uh, doors by Walter Gilbert. So there's an interesting slippage between what one might call fine art or what might be decorative or applied art when it comes to the outfitting of ship interiors of this kind and uh, panels by uh, a 
Andreas Duncan Kars. This is a part of the Veranda Grill, the extra tariff first class special dining saloon, which has a, a series of panels depicting a kind of narrative of circus and entertainment by the very wonderful Doris Sinkheisen. Uh, she also instructed White Alum on the wider decoration of the room, which is uh, very beautiful and very coherent. And here's a medley of other artworks that are surviving and that are dotted around the first class accommodation uh, still on the ship as it is today. This is a part of the, the first class hallway, cabin class hallway, with a bar relief by Maurice Lambert. Then we have got uh, works by Kathleen Scott, the bust of Queen Mary, and the, the beautiful cocktail bar, which still functions as a cocktail bar on the ship today, Alfred Reginald Thompson's Royal Jubilee Week panel behind the bar. Uh, the tourist classrooms have not survived with such completeness, but the main lounge is still there with its panels by Anna Zinkheisen and uh, two sculptures by the Glasgow School of Art, uh, Tutor Norman John Forrest from the Tourist Class Dining Saloon, a lost space, are still on display in the ship's foyer in a, in a vitrine. Um, so we're working on the project and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to making progress over the coming months. Um, the, Post-war, one shall consider ships like the Oriana from 1960. This is a big mural by John Piper from the First Class Princess Lounge. This is a, a couple of pop designs by a Royal College of Art student called Tim Sarson from the Queen Elizabeth II from 1968. And uh, here is a panel by Franta Bilski from the British Rail North Sea passenger ship ferry St. Edmund, depicting the martyrdom and canonization of St. Edmund. So, any very, very broad variety of work, ranging from 1930s realism, impressionism, and uh, surrealism, and uh, you know, all the different schools then, to work that's very much uh, in pop art and abstraction and the post-war uh, aesthetics as they emerged in the 50s and 1960s. Thank you very much indeed, Faye, again. Thank you for listening, and thank you for coming out tonight. And I think we're going to now sit down and have questions. Thank you. So, yes, now, if anyone has got any questions or comments, either in the room or online, then we'll be very pleased to respond. How much did the Royal College of Art in Glasgow feed into the design process of the ships? Of course, Glasgow was one of the biggest shipbuilding centres in the world at the time. Actually, very little, um, or not, not at all. Um, for the prestigious liners, it was typical that famous decorators from London who were established names were hired by the shipping companies. Um, by the interwar era, a number of uh, professional decorating companies who had specialisms in ship interiors which developed from earlier work doing hotels and banks and shop fitting and department stores, you know, buildings on terra firma, uh, moved into uh, ship uh, outfitting. Companies like Waring and Gillow, I mentioned Heat and Tab, White Alum, uh, various Maples, H.H. Um, H. Martin in Cheltenham, various others, and they often offered a kind of one-stop shop. Waring and Gillow, uh, for a brief phase, employed Sergei Shemaev, so they uh, had a, a modern, modern design department, and they could do everything from neo-Tudor to modernism, and what, whatever a client wanted, they would provide. Um, Glasgow School of Art did train several artists and architects who then went on to work with architecture firms. Shipping companies, though, tend to be quite conservative and not to want to take risks, so they go with established names. <laughs>
Um, we have a few online questions. I'll start with one, um, and then we can go back to the room. Um, Huda Mustafa said, thank you for a fascinating lecture, and, and has a rather extensive um, question, but asks, what were the parameters of interclass, interracial intimacies? The life of the liner voyage is certainly, as you say, a grand event of display and networking and cultural sharing slash competition among the wealthy or elites of the time, leading no doubt to numerous social business and marriage networks. Have you written about this in detail? Also, were there also subjects of the colonies traveling in the same or other types of ships and voyages? And how, when, and where did these African and Asian or West Indian persons interact with the scenario which you have painted? Were they mostly men, students, migrants, etc.? Despite segregation, was there also interclass racial exchange in the voyage context? I'm very pleased that Rebecca has offered to give me a copy of the Zoom chat afterwards so I can keep hold of that whole text. That is quite a big question, which I'm not sure I can fully address here, but I could make one um, relevant point, which actually comes from the research of one of my PhD students named Eamon Connor. He's been looking at um, Lascar or South Asian labor on board ocean liners. And he's been very interested in the extent to which those workers interacted with the passengers um, and the way that they might be put on display, especially in boarding and disembarking as a kind of almost like exoticized spectacle, but then would be kept out of sight during the rest of the voyage and certainly wouldn't be given very much space um, to live in, leading to some sort of unpleasant contrast with the space accorded to the passengers. So I think that's just one dimension of it. Um, but the aspect of class in just in relation to passengers. I think that the sort of very rigid barriers between the classes prevented a lot of mixing. But the literary text that I'm looking at often stage transgressions. So people from the third class sneak into the first class, jump over the barriers. Children in particular kind of tend to run amok a bit. Um, and as I showed in the Sitwell's play, the passengers kind of invading the, um, the crew areas. Now that would really, I think, have been much less likely um, on a real liner. But you could go on a tour as a passenger. You, you could go on tours which would take you into the working areas and which would enable you to see selected parts of them, I think. Um, is there anything you could add I to that? I think that's uh, absolutely... Um, I, I would call to mind uh, many years ago at Glasgow School of Art, we had, uh, when I had newly joined the institution, we had... Uh, a, a, conference at which the keynote was an up-and-coming academic called Slavoj Žižek, <laughs> and he talked about the recently released uh, James Cameron film about Titanic, and his laconic remark was, thank goodness it sank, because the greater disaster would be had it arrived in New York with a third-class passenger and a first-class passenger having fallen in love. And uh, but that, he was being facetious, of course, but it, you know the it is actually true that the class boundaries were very, very strictly enforced and that one simply couldn't very easily get from one class to another. Um, Catherine Anderson said, I'm curious about the offstage quality of the ocean itself in the examples you analyze. The ocean remains the ultimate stage then, empty, timeless, ahistorical. Are there no instances in this period in which the materiality of the ocean or its inhabitants intrudes and makes its presence felt? That's a really nice question, thank you. There definitely are in fiction. I haven't come across a lot in terms of stage productions. And apart from that image that I had with the cocktail bar and the waves lapping around it, the sea really wasn't present as, um, as the person asking the question said. Um, but in novels, I, there are quite a lot more where the sea literally comes over the rail, sea creatures um, come over the rail or, or are viewed from the ship in which there's a lot more sense of the kind of salty marine environment. Um, but I think that would be pretty difficult to convey um, on stage. Um, so, yeah, it's more something that I've got found in the fiction and the poetry where particularly the ones that focus on the concept of sea change, like how people actually feel a kind of physiological and emotional shifts when they're on the ocean. And that's a theme that a lot of writers explore, that people behave in uncharacteristic ways. 
because of the effect of tides and waves on their body and their feelings. So I think the ocean's definitely there, but I, don't, I didn't find it in the place, I must say. As a sort of building on that question, I wondered whether the um, destination or the route had an impact on both uh, the content of a play or the design, because I'm kind of interested in whether... Um, you know, sailing between Britain and America, for example, or the northern voyages is sort of somehow encapsulated either in the, the, the content of a play or the kind of style of a design and whether that kind of those geographies have an impact on what we see aesthetically. Definitely true in the design. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, I, on the transatlantic run, uh, all the European com liner companies who dominated the, the trade wanted to present the better faces of the nation to the uh, American public. And of course, in uh, those days, the ships were open to the public in New York. Well, the, the ships typically took several days to turn around in port, and the, the crews had shore leave, but uh, members of the public in the 30s could come on board and dine Queen in the Mary ship's restaurant. Yes. Queen Mary, I visited as a child mm. in 1958. And yep. you, could you could go on board, and I think... Classes. Yep, and you could make... Uh, there's just a comment from the audience, so a microphone's being brought. And secondly, so that was 58, fast forward to 97 and the Fourth World Congress on Art Deco in Los Angeles, and I went to the Queen Mary, and I think the Queen Mary has the best decorative art of the 30s from Britain, undoubtedly. It's simply stupendous. But as a child, I hardly remember it, just the enormous spaces. Then we went to the Isle of Wight, sat on the beach at Tottenham Bay, and then it, it went past you on its way to New York. Very wonderful. You can't really capture that. <laughs> I think one that's very. I, I think one observation I would make also is that I, particularly on colonial liners, it was very interesting what wasn't said. So. Uh, to the greatest degree, uh, co British colonial liners, uh, P&O, British India, uh, the various other operators, uh, attempted to create the atmosphere of Britain, or the kind of atmosphere of Britain that involved Pall Mall clubs, Whitehall ministries, the sorts of environment, slightly neo-Georgian, that uh, the, the, the wealthy bulk of the travelers would be familiar with, occasionally with a heavily romanticized nod to the destination. Uh, on the South African run, uh, simply nothing was said about black Africa. Uh, the, the designs of these vessels were by the, a very good uh, London decorator called Jean Monroe, who did work for the National Trust, and she was a great uh, you know, Georgian revivalist, region, Regency revivalist, um, and had done a lot of restoration work on historic buildings, an able, able person, but she was hired um, in order to create a kind of dainty, elegant um, atmosphere that was rather divorced from the, the, the world in which these vessels operated. And uh, uh, so I think what's missing is often very telling in itself. Yeah, I think just to add to that about the destinations and the impact... The certain vein play, the most interesting thing is none of the passengers know where they're going, and that's how they finally realise um, what's happening. But more usually, I have noticed that there are a lot of literary narratives where it's almost irrelevant. Like the gaze is turned so inward into the spaces of the ship. Yeah, that you don't even know often where the ship is sailing to. But there are others in which it does play much more of a part, particularly when it's a sort of long voyage, like let's say from Sri Lanka or Java or something back to the UK, and it's going to be three weeks, so you have a much different atmosphere from the five-day society, the short-lived society that was created on those transatlantic voyages. So I'm just going to um, read out one more question from online, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, but Joseph Sharples writes, there are examples of ships in motion being represented on Victorian stage. Did interwar stage designers ever represent moving ships? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a very good question. Um, Joseph Sharples was the curator of that exhibition I was talking about, the <laughs> stage and screen um, in Glasgow. But that's a really interesting point about the victory. I think there was a lot of machinery that was used to represent those um, ships. I haven't found any interwar examples. The cavalcade did have some very elaborate stage machinery, and there were some kind of moving parts to the set. But I don't think they actually tried to show the ship moving off the stage, as far as I can understand it from the reviews. But um, that's a great question, actually. I think I really need to think some more about that idea of how you represent motion in the static space of the stage, which actually was one of the things I, I wanted to discover but still haven't quite found enough evidence in the reviews for. But I think it's fascinating. So thank you. Well, so I know for those of you in the room that we'll be able to continue this conversation over drinks. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to give one last thanks to Faye and Bruce. This was really fascinating, and um, thank you. Thank you.